Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father, and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The text for the fourth Sunday in Advent comes from our Gospel reading of Luke. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Let's follow the text. Mary goes in haste to a town in Judah. Like a teenage-sized, fleshy Ark of the Covenant, she carries the Lord to the hill country outside of Jerusalem, just like King David had so many years before. And certainly Mary was a little bit scared when the angel had told her that she was to become the temporary house of God. She couldn't quite understand it. Who among us could either if put in her shoes? But she had resigned herself to the glorious impossible. When God declares something to be true, true it is. And it doesn't matter if it makes sense. It doesn't matter if it can't possibly be. It doesn't matter if everything else says different. God's word creates and performs exactly what it prescribes. And so the virgin is with child, and that child is God in the flesh. Now, apart from all the other fears that an unwed teenage mother must have, certainly having God reside in her womb was the most surreal But the surreal sometimes takes a back seat to the things that are right there and understood. And the understood said that she might be best to scurry off away from her hometown for a couple of months. The last thing that she needed was for some overzealous religious fanatic to throw a couple rocks at her head because she was found to be with child when she shouldn't have been. And so she runs to her trusted cousin, to Elizabeth. To a woman who was in the midst of her own miracle and therefore might be the only person on the entire planet to have the slightest understanding of what Mary might be going through. But even Elizabeth can't comprehend the miracle of all miracles that's happened to Mary. Hers was something that could at least be explained through science and biology. Hers was something that had happened before in the Old Testament, at least a couple of times, not to mention the unknown and untold times that a barren woman found herself pregnant after years of pleading to the Lord. But Mary is something altogether different. And her story has to be something that is accepted by faith, for logic and reason can't bring you there. Only the working of the Holy Spirit through the proclamation of the word. And so Mary comes to the house of Elizabeth and greets her with a greeting that has never been greeted in the whole history of the world. And I have to believe that this was no simple hello, for a hello can't proclaim the gospel. The gospel has to be proclaimed and heard in words and phrases, in story, in proclamation. And the Holy Spirit only works through the word. He's never promised to bring faith apart from the word that proclaims and edifies and enlightens. He's no mystic, neither are we. He speaks his word through the mouths of unworthy people to bring new life and good news to others who are unworthy. And so Mary, she speaks this gospel greeting to Elizabeth, and Elizabeth is dumbstruck. I would have loved to be a fly on the wall as Mary spilled her gospel greeting out in the frantic words of a teenager overcome with a miracle that's too miraculous to be true. But it is true nonetheless. And surely Mary told Elizabeth about the angel and about her confusion and about Gabriel's proclamation, about the moment in which the Holy Spirit conceived in her God in the flesh through the words that were uttered out of that very messenger's mouth. For once again, God's word creates what it proclaims. And so when God says, Mary, you are with child, she is with child. And when Elizabeth hears Mary's greeting, she's filled with the Holy Spirit, which is to say nothing less than she's pregnant with belief. And not just her, 
but her miracle six-month-old unborn baby inside of her. John leaps for joy within his mother, a little baby leap, an alive little human leap, alive in the flesh, for what baby sitting in his mother's womb isn't alive, and alive in the spirit, alive in faith, because of the proclamation of the word that he had inexplicably heard as well. Who says that a little baby can't believe, even an unborn one? John certainly did. But Elizabeth, I think she seems to be a little bit troubled as well. She certainly knows that Mary is blessed, for she holds in her womb the Messiah, the Christ, the one who has been promised since the time that our first mother threw the world into sin and death and yet was given a gospelly word of life and salvation and forgiveness even when she, and yes, Adam too, most certainly Adam too, deserved to hear nothing but judgment and damnation. And it's this judgment, it's this damnation stuff that the sinner expects to hear Intrinsically, the sinner knows that he's a sinner, and so intrinsically, the sinner knows that when God speaks to him, when God comes to him, it should be with words that are terrifying, and it should be in ways that kill. And so along with the exclamation of joy, Elizabeth also lets out a question. It seems to be peppered with uncertainty and veiled with the shadow of dread. Why is this granted to me? that the mother of my Lord should come to me? It's an honest question, to be sure. And it's one that we all, if truth be told, must ask of ourselves. For Elizabeth is sure that she doesn't deserve to be in the presence of this Mary-sized temple in which God has now decided to temporarily dwell even if he is only a God-sized dot in the womb of this woman standing in front of her. But that right there should give Elizabeth pause because God doesn't come into her presence as the big and bold, powerful God of the universe that she expects. He doesn't come to her with the terrors of the night and wrath and thundering words of damnation. God's doing something different, something unexpected, something contrary to what it would seem he should do. And this doesn't make sense. It's all so confusing. It's all so backwards. It's all so weak and pitiful and unlike God. But that's how God's been working from the very beginning. And this is how God has been bringing his saving grace to our fallen, sinful human race ever since the moment we rejected him and expected nothing but his wrath. God comes into this world for the salvation of mankind in the very same way that he's going to leave it, in a way that no one could have guessed or expected. And his entrance should have given us some hint at how he's going to do things, how he's going to save, who he's going to come to, and who he comes for. He saves in weakness. In fact, in the weakest way possible. And his conception tells of that. So does his birth. What's more meager than an unwed virgin? What's more backwards than a baby in a swaddling cloth and placed in a cattle stall? What's weaker than a bloody cross and a stone-sealed tomb? So God comes to a teenage mother and an old barren woman. And his whole life is going to be the exact same sort of stuff. Fishermen and tax collectors and lepers and prostitutes. These are the people that God comes to. Not because they're the good ones. Not because he pretends that sin doesn't harm, doesn't destroy, doesn't kill. But he knows that sin will do all of those things. And us weak, sinful sinners must be saved from ourselves. That's the whole point of the Messiah, the Christ. It's the whole point of Jesus, of God in the flesh. He comes to be, he comes as the unexpected God comes, but he doesn't come bringing wrath. He comes as a physician for the weak, 
for those who are too sick and can't heal themselves. He comes as a shepherd for sheep too stupid to find their own way home. He comes to be a savior for those who need saving, not for those who can save themselves. That's who he comes to. In fact, that's the only ones that he comes to. Jesus doesn't come to those who deserve his presence. He doesn't reside with those who have earned it or are good enough or worthy enough for him to hang out with. No, he comes precisely to those who aren't worthy, who say things like, why is this granted to me? Or he has looked upon the humble estate of his servant. Or I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. Or remember me when you enter into your kingdom. Jesus comes to Mary and to Elizabeth and to John in Elizabeth's womb, not because they're such saintly saints, but because they're such sinful sinners who need the Messiah just as much as the tax collector and the prostitute, just as much as you and me. Jesus comes to sinners. That's all he does. And nothing has changed. In fact, it can't. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. What makes me worthy to receive my Lord here today? What have I done that's good enough or great enough to have earned to be in his presence, this privilege to know that God is with me always to the very end of the age? I know myself just as much as you all know yourselves. None of us here are worthy. None of us here are any better than any of those out there. And that's why this place isn't for those who've earned it. It's for those who couldn't have earned it in a million years. And so church, this place where God comes to be with us in order to proclaim his message of salvation, to give life, to forgive sins, this place is for sinners, and so this place is for everyone. That's why we come here today. That's why we will later on this week, maybe even three times in a row. (laughs) Because Jesus, inexplicably, wants to come to us and save us. He wants to speak with us and wash us clean and even dine with us. He wants to be the forgiver of those who need forgiveness and the savior of those who need saving. And so he comes to the sinner in order to make us saints. And he comes to the cursed in order to make us blessed. And he comes to us dead men in order to make us alive once again in him. And so, yes, I certainly may still tremble at the thought of the big almighty God. And I may cower in my sin, and I might want to hide my face away from him. I may still ask why God deigns it good to come to me, for I'm not worthy of even a glimpse of his love. But then he speaks his gospely words to me, which are so simple and so clear. He comes to me because I would be lost and dead without him. He has come in the flesh to this fallen world, And he comes today in your presence in word and sacrament, not because you're a worthy saint, but because you're a worthless sinner. Why, you ask, does your Lord come to you? So that he might save you. In the name of Jesus.